We looked at epithelial tissues before. Remember, epithelial tissues are exposed at one surface. They're exposed to the outside environment or they're exposed to an internal environment, an internal space of some sort. Now we're going to look at connective tissues. Connective tissues fill in the gaps. They connect different tissues together. Having said that, some connective tissues do have specialized functions and you're seeing one of those right here. So we've got adipose cells here or fat cells. They look like great big empty cells, but in fact they contain triglycerides. They fill up with triglycerides and store energy. Before we continue, I just want to remind you that we have four types of tissue. We have two that are very, very specialized. Muscle tissue contracts. It consists of cells that contract forcefully to bring about movement. Nervous tissue consists of cells that are going to send out electrical signals, action potentials. Epithelial tissue, again, always exposed to an open space of some sort. And then connective tissue, tying all of these different tissues together. Because connective tissue is sort of the glue that holds other tissue types together, it's very common throughout the body. It's derived from mesoderm. So mesoderm is that middle layer within the very early embryo. And in some cases, it can consist almost entirely of extracellular matrix. So remember that cells secrete and build this extracellular matrix around them to help protect them and stick them together. And this layer can become very thick between some cells. Within this extracellular matrix, we're going to have different protein fibers, and we're going to have cells that may, in some cases, wander around to maintain that matrix. Throughout most of your body, cells are not in direct contact with each other. We've talked about some of the exceptions. We've talked about gap junctions and tight junctions and desmosomes, for instance, but quite frequently, we just have a thick layer of extracellular matrix that glues cells together. That extracellular matrix consists of a ground substance or matrix that's made up of glycoproteins and proteoglycans. And this gel-like substance is going to also contain cables, ropes, that help maintain structure. And those cables consist of collagen and elastic fibers and some other proteinaceous fibers. The consistency of the extracellular matrix is going to be quite different in different tissues. It may be rather rigid in some tissues. And we'll talk about bone and cartilage, for instance, that are rather rigid tissues. It can be rather gel-like and allow for a lot of movement so loose connective tissues, or in some cases, connective tissue can be entirely liquid, entirely fluid. So blood is a connective tissue. Connective tissues tend to have very good nerve and blood supply. A notable exception would be cartilage and tendons. And we'll come back to the implications of this in just a moment. Now at the bottom here, the diagram you're seeing is showing loose connective tissue, areolar tissue. There's a lot going on there. We have a lot of different uh, cell types that you can see. We have a blood vessel, a capillary. So again, these tend to be tissues that have a good blood supply. We have macrophages that are wandering around and looking for debris and gobbling things up. We have other components of the immune system like neutrophils and mast cells and plasma cells and eosinophils. We'll come back to those. And then we have a whole lot of fibers. So we have collagen, we have elastic fibers, we might have reticular fibers as well. Note that we also have adipocytes, fat cells. So this is a tissue that we can use to store energy. Fibroblasts, that great big green cell in the middle there, is a cell that is going to generate collagen and other connective fibers. And these cells can wander around, they can reproduce through mitosis and maintain this tissue. 
fibroblasts will secrete the proteinaceous fibers and also the proteoglycans and glycoproteins. Adipocytes are going to store energy in the form of fat, triglycerides predominantly. White blood cells are going to leak out of capillaries and wander around in connective tissue. We have macrophages that will engulf bacteria and debris. We have plasma cells that can produce antibodies that will bind to foreign substances and hopefully deactivate them. So for instance, antibodies might bind to proteins on the surface of a bacterium that the bacterium would use to attach to and enter one of your cells. We also have mast cells. Mast cells are going to produce histamine and that will dilate blood vessels. So let's say that we have injury to the skin. We have connective tissue under the skin. Mast cells are sitting there waiting and when there's damage to nearby cells, they will receive a signal that tells them to release histamine, dilate blood vessels, allow more blood flow to that area so that white blood cells can get there and attack any potential pathogens. The ground substance of the extracellular matrix is often gelatinous in nature and it's made up of a mixture of protein and sugar. So we have glycoproteins that are mostly protein with a bit of sugar. So in this case, the backbone of the molecule is a chain of amino acids, and then we have sugars attached to that. And we also have proteoglycans, which are the opposite. They're mostly sugar with a bit of protein. And that's what you're seeing here. This is a proteoglycan, and as you can see, it's a very large molecule. So down the middle, the backbone of the molecule here is made up of sugar. And then attached to those sugars, we have proteins. So hanging off of that sugar backbone, we have these chains of amino acids. Attached to the amino acids, we have chains of sugar. So these fine little filaments here are made out of two types of sugar one known as keratin sulfate and the other known as chondroitin. Now don't get keratin mixed up with keratin. Keratin is a protein, keratin is sugar. Chondroitin sulfate is something that we see in large amounts in cartilage. Chondros means cartilage. Now these are huge molecules and because of that they have a massive surface area and they tend to adsorb a lot of water. They bind to a lot of water. And that combination of water and these proteins and sugars gives us this jelly-like substance. In some cases, these large molecules can also grab onto a lot of minerals, specifically calcium. That's a process known as calcification. And if these uh, matrices become calcified, then we have a more rigid structure, and that's what we see in bone. Some connective tissues are essentially just really, really thick layers of extracellular matrix that have been secreted by nearby cells. Remember that in the extracellular matrix, we have our ground substance or matrix that's composed of something that resists compression. If we go back to the analogy we used before when we were looking at tissues, we talked about concrete as our matrix and rebar as our fibers. So the concrete is going to resist compression, the rebar is going to resist stretching, it's going to resist tension. Let's take a look at the fibers that resist tension. We have collagen, which is by far the most common fiber that we see in connective tissue. Collagen, remember, is composed of three polypeptides wrapped around each other, but then those collagen molecules are going to be braided together to create a much larger fiber. The fiber is very tough and resistant. It's going to resist stretching. It's going to provide some flexibility to the tissue that it's found in. It's found in bone, cartilage, tendons, and ligaments, and those are the things that you would boil up in a big pot if you wanted to make gelatin, but it's found in skin and uh, lots of other areas throughout the body as well.
the lady in the last photo is having collagen injected into her lips. So this is an effective way of plumping up the skin. And what's happening there is you're taking collagen and you're shooting it into the interstitial space between cells. And this is somewhere that it would normally exist as part of the extracellular matrix. However, it's not gonna really incorporate itself into the extracellular matrix. It hasn't been built there. It hasn't been attached to the scaffold that exists between the cells. So eventually it will be broken down and it will be removed. But if you wanna plump up your lips, you can do this occasionally by injecting this additional collagen. So how is collagen made? Well, remember that collagen consists of three polypeptides. What you're seeing in this diagram here is the process that's used to produce a collagen fiber. So we have our precursor collagen polypeptide. That's going to be produced by a ribosome. The ribosome is going to pass that into the endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum will take three of them, attach them to each other, twist them, and form a collagen molecule, which will then be passed on to the Golgi and then secreted out of the cell. Once it's on the outside of the cell, collagen molecules will be assembled into a much, much larger collagen fiber. Hopefully you've had a chance to look at areolar tissue in the lab. You'll see that these collagen fibers are actually very, very large. In some cases, collagen simply isn't stretchy enough. And in those cases, your body might employ a protein known as elastin. Elastin can form fibers known as elastin fibers or elastic fibers. And these fibers, as the name suggests, are very, very stretchy. They also store a lot of potential energy. So we have these elastic fibers and the fibers are surrounded by a layer of fibrillin, which is a glycoprotein. These fibers can expand, and then when they contract passively, they can generate some force. We find these in the skin, we find them in blood vessels, and we find them in the lungs. Next term, we'll talk about these in quite a bit more detail when we talk about the functioning of the lungs, for instance. So you expand the lungs, by dropping the diaphragm, and that requires energy to do, of course. But when you expel air, when you breathe out, you're relying on these elastic fibers. So the stored potential energy that was stored during inhalation is going to be released to expel air from the lungs. Collagen fibrils act like ropes or cables. They resist tension, and they're quite strong. Elastic fibers, on the other hand, are going to stretch when we apply a force. We can apply a lot of force. In fact, it will take a lot of force to stretch them out completely. But once they're stretched out completely, if that force is removed, they will recoil back to their original shape. So elastic fibers provide a means of storing energy. If we stretch out an organ, that organ will return to its original shape if we have a lot of elastic fibers incorporated into the connective tissue or extracellular matrix that makes up that organ. Not only does fibrillin form the sheath around elastic fibers, it also helps regulate the rate at which connective tissue develops. If you're not manufacturing fibrillin, connective tissues can develop more rapidly. And you might end up with a condition known as Marfan syndrome. So people who have Marfan syndrome have a genetic disorder where the gene that codes for the protein fibrillin is not working correctly. They have very long, long bones. So they have very tall, lanky bodies as a result. But also because they're not making this fibrillin or they're not making fibrillin that's functioning correctly, they're gonna have weakened elastic fibers. And that can be very serious, especially when it comes to tissues that need to stretch. 
like the aorta. So the aorta is the major artery in your body. It's receiving blood from the heart that's under quite a lot of pressure. And the aorta needs to be able to stretch and relax to take that pulse, to take that wave of pressure from the blood. And if it can't, then the aorta could rupture. And of course, that's very serious. I should point out that if you have Marfan syndrome, it doesn't mean you can't make any fibrillin at all. There are several different forms of fibrillin. There are different genes that code for those different forms, but you're lacking functional fibrillin of one of these particular types. This is a classic test for Marfan syndrome. We can see that this individual here has very long fingers and a very long thumb. You can take your thumb, you can wrap it around your other wrist and touch or overlap with your pinky finger as you see here. We've talked about collagen, we've talked about elastic fibers. Another type of fiber known as the reticular fiber can be quite common in some tissues, particularly tissues that are rather soft. So organs that are rather soft like the spleen need this extra protein to provide kind of a scaffold. So if we look at the spleen and we look at the cells that make up the spleen, they're attached fairly loosely to each other. We don't see a lot of desmosomes and we don't see tight connections between the cells. Instead, we have this kind of open structure and we may have some fairly large spaces between the cells as well that are filled with interstitial fluid. So this sort of tissue needs some sort of scaffold and the cells are attached to the scaffold of reticular fibers, as you can see in this diagram here. Now that we've taken a look at the ground substance and fibers that are involved, let's take a look at the tissues themselves. Broadly speaking, we have four categories of connective tissue. We have loose connective tissue, which is going to contain all three of the different types of fibers we've talked about, and it's going to form sort of a meshwork within this gelatinous ground substance. There's several types of cells mixed in and the cells are free to wander around within that mixture. Then we have dense connective tissue, which as the name suggests is much denser. It contains a very high proportion of collagen fibers. And this is a tissue that's usually under rather large tensional stresses. Then we have supportive connective tissue. Now we're talking about tissues that are more rigid because they've been mineralized. So that would be bone and cartilage. And then finally, we have fluid connective tissues, which are mostly water. So we're talking about blood and lymph here. Let's start with loose connective tissue. So again, we've got a, a gelatin-like matrix or ground material, and then we've got fibers that have been woven throughout that into kind of like a, a web or a network. We have three different types. We have areolar connective tissue. We have adipose connective tissue. This would be fat cells. And then we have reticular tissue, which is what you're seeing in the photo here. Areolar connective tissue contains all three types of fibers. So we have reticular fibers, collagen fibers, and elastic fibers. We have good blood supply to this tissue. So we have capillaries that can leak out white blood cells that can then wander around within this tissue. So eosinophils, plasma cells, neutrophils, these are all forms of white blood cells. Eosinophils will attack parasites. Neutrophils will launch attacks against foreign cells and other foreign substances. And plasma cells produce antibodies that of course play a major role in the immune response. We have mast cells that can release histamine. That's going to dilate blood vessels, increase blood flow to the area so that more white blood cells can get to the tissue if needed, if there's an infection, if there's damage. We have fibroblasts that are wandering around and constructing these fibers. So they're maintaining the tissue and repairing the tissue if that's something that has to occur. And then we also may have adipocytes mixed in that store fat. We have macrophages as well that wander around and clean up debris and can also digest and destroy foreign cells. One of the areas where you would find this is in the subcutaneous layer. We have this stretchy white material called fascia that connects the skin to the underlying muscle. 
and it's very elastic because of the elastic fibers that it contains so that the skin can move around as the muscles move around underneath it. Hopefully by this point you've all had a chance to see areolar connective tissue under the microscope. When you looked at this tissue, you would have seen very thick fibers, which are collagen fibers. And in our slides, they're usually stained pink. And then there's very thin, very well-defined fibers known as elastic fibers, which usually stain kind of a purplish color. There's lots of cells that you might have been able to see under your microscope. You wouldn't be able to pick out the different types necessarily, but in all likelihood, most of the cells that you saw were fibroblasts. Fibroblasts are very common in this tissue. They can undergo mitosis rapidly if there's damage to this tissue. And we talked about that a bit when we talked about the cell cycle. So if there is damage to this tissue, platelets will make their way there through the blood supply and they will release platelet derived growth factor and tell these cells to divide and get busy repairing that tissue. Adipose tissue is more commonly referred to as fat, and its primary role is to store energy in the form of triglycerides. So our triglycerides are large, hydrophobic, very stable molecules that contain a lot of nonpolar bonds. So they're perfect for storing chemical energy for long periods of time. When you look at adipose tissue, it looks like a lot of empty space, but what you're seeing are the adipocytes, the fat cells, and they're very large. When you put on weight, when you gain fat, what's happening is these fat cells are growing in size. So instead of growing more cells, you're actually expanding the size of these cells and they can expand a lot. So the cells store energy, but they do a couple other things as well. They provide some protection and padding. You'll have thick layers of fat under the skin that makes up the soles of your feet, for instance. And in some animals, they're involved in thermal regulation. Not as much in us, but in a lot of marine mammals like whales uh, and um, uh, walruses and things like that, there's a thick layer of blubber that helps to trap heat. There's fat within our long bones as well, and that makes up something known as yellow marrow. Another type of fat that's quite common in infants, doesn't play as big a role in adults, is brown fat. Brown fat's found mostly along the back in infants, and it contains a lot of mitochondria, which makes it kind of unusual compared to most adipose tissue. The mitochondria are gonna break down that energy and release a lot of heat. And that's because cellular respiration is rather inefficient. Infants do this because they don't have much muscle mass. So whereas we would shiver and generate excess heat that way, they generate heat when they really need it using this brown fat. And our last loose connective tissue is reticular connective tissue. What you're seeing here is a slide and a diagram of the situation that we see in lymph nodes. And lymph nodes are rather soft tissues. So this is a tissue where lymph fluid is flowing through this almost like a filter. And this filter contains these cells that are strapped onto this scaffold of reticular fibers. So lymph nodes and other soft organs like the liver, the spleen, bone marrow, contain this scaffold of reticular proteins because the cells themselves are not rigidly attached to each other. Dense connective tissue contains far fewer cells than loose connective tissue. It contains a lot more fiber as well. The fibers are thicker and they're densely packed. We have three types of dense connective tissue. We have dense regular connective tissue in which all the fibers are running parallel. They're all running in the same orientation. And then we have dense irregular connective tissue where the fibers are running in different directions. And then finally we have elastic connective tissue, which is quite a bit stretchier. And that's because it contains elastic fibers. Dense regular connective tissue contains a lot of collagen. It's mostly collagen. And the collagen is gonna be found in these thick bundles that run parallel to each other. The bundles orient themselves in the direction of the stress 
that's generated within the tissue. So a nice example of dense regular connective tissue would be tendons. Tendons are found at the ends of muscles. They connect the belly of a muscle, the contractile part of a muscle, to a bone. So the muscle is going to contract, that's going to generate tension, and the tension is going to be transferred through the tendon to the bone. And we can tell where the tension is being generated. It's being generated in this direction, in our example here, because that's how the collagen fibers have oriented themselves. The collagen fibers are like ropes, and they are going to be uh, transferring that tensional force to bone. In dense irregular connective tissue, we once again have a very tough tissue with lots of collagen, but the collagen bundles are running in different directions. And that's because this tissue is receiving force from many different directions. So a good example would be the sclera, or white of the eyeball. The eyeball, of course, is a sphere, and there's fluid inside that's under pressure pushing out on the sclera. So the sclera is being stretched in every direction. So it has collagen running as cables every which way to take these stresses that are coming in all directions. In elastic connective tissue, we have bundles of elastic fibers. So they're not individual elastic fibers like we saw in the areolar tissue. Instead, they're bundled together and these bundles tend to branch. They have a tree-like shape to them. This allows the tissue to be stretched quite a bit, but then return back to its original shape. A really good example would be the aorta of the heart. So blood comes out into the aorta under quite a lot of pressure. The aorta actually expands a little bit and then it contracts. And as it does that, it gives the blood a little extra push. So of course, most of the push is coming from the heart itself, but the aorta, because it's stretchy, gives a bit more oomph to the blood as it goes on to the rest of your body. Cartilage is a support tissue, but it also forms slippery surfaces within synovial joints. It consists of this network of collagen fibers and elastic fibers that are embedded within chondroitin sulfate. And that chondroitin sulfate is going to form a very dense gel. So the collagen fibers are going to provide strength, elastic fibers, provide a bit of elasticity, and the chondroitin is going to resist compression. The chondrocytes are the cells that maintain this material, and they're found within little spaces called lacunae, or lacuna, if we're talking about a single space. Around the outside of cartilage, we have a dense irregular connective tissue, and this is known as the perichondrium. Again, chondros means having to do with cartilage, peri means around the outside, think of perimeter. Now, one thing that's unusual about cartilage is that it has very poor, if any, blood supply. We don't have blood vessels, we don't have nerves running through the actual cartilage. They only go as far as the perichondrium. And because of that, cartilage grows quite slowly. It doesn't have a lot of oxygen and metabolites available to it. So this is something to think about. You've probably heard the expression, be good to your knees, you'll miss them when they're gone. If you damage the cartilage in your knees or other joints, it repairs itself very, very slowly, and it may never repair itself completely. We have three types of cartilage in our bodies. We have hyaline cartilage, which is shown in blue in this diagram. It makes up the cartilages of the larynx and trachea and the nose, and it's also found within synovial joints where it makes up the articular cartilages. So that's where we have surfaces of bone sliding past each other. Hyaline cartilage is very slippery. It makes up the costal cartilages of the rib cage, uh, so it's found throughout the body. Then we have fibrocartilage. As the name suggests, it's got more fibers in it. It's a little bit tougher. That's shown in red on this diagram. It makes up part of the intervertebral discs, and it makes up the pubic symphysis, which is where the two halves of the pelvis come together. Then we have elastic cartilage. And as the name suggests, elastic cartilage is stretchier and more flexible. One of the best examples of that would be the cartilages in the ears. Hyaline cartilage is the most abundant of the cartilages, but it's also the weakest. 
It consists mainly of this dense gel matrix or ground substance, and it has some collagen in it, but the collagen fibers are quite fine. They're quite thin, they don't show up under the microscope. It provides flexibility and support. So for instance, the trachea contains rings of cartilage that keep the trachea open so that you can breathe. At the joints, it reduces shock and it reduces friction. So what you're seeing in this diagram is the end of the femur and the top of the tibia, and the end of the femur is covered in hyaline cartilage, which is quite slippery. Another fascinating role played by hyaline cartilage occurs during development. So you can see a fetus here, and you can see the beginnings of the skeleton, but it's not made of bone yet in this diagram. It's made of cartilage. So many of the bones of your skeleton are laid down as cartilage first. There's a cartilaginous model of the skeleton, it's called, and then the cartilage is slowly replaced by bone. And we'll talk about that more in our next topic. So hyaline cartilage is this bluish, shiny, white, rubbery substance. It's what you see on the end of a chicken drumstick, for instance. And it consists mostly of matrix. So when you look at it under the microscope, you won't see fibers in it typically. The fibers are too small. But you'll see this background matrix. And then within that, these holes or spaces called lacunae. And within the lacunae, we've got chondrocytes, the cells that maintain the proper functioning of cartilage. There's no blood vessels, no nerves, and because of that repair and growth is very slow. And as I mentioned, one of the main functions of hyaline cartilage in the body is to reduce friction at joints. Fibrocartilage contains a lot more fibers than hyaline cartilage, and the fibers are larger. They're bundled together and we can actually see them under the microscope. Now, because we have more fibers, this is a stronger material than hyaline cartilage. So those fibers are acting like cables and they help the tissue resist tensional stresses. One of the places that we find this tissue is within the intervertebral discs between the vertebrae. So here they're acting like shock absorbers. Basically, the intervertebral discs are quite tough on the outside. That's where the fibrocartilage is. And then we have a more fluid gel within the center. Fibrocartilage is the strongest of the three cartilages. And here you can see fibrocartilage under the microscope. Again, we have lacunae that contain the chondrocytes, just like we did in hyaline cartilage. But you can see we have these visible fibers as well. Finally, we have elastic cartilage. Elastic cartilage contains a lot of elastic fibers, and that makes this tissue more malleable or flexible. A nice example would be the ear. So the ear has its own sort of internal skeleton made out of elastic cartilage that maintains the shape of the ear, but of course you can deform and wiggle your ears around and they will pop back to their original shape, hopefully. There's a perichondrium in this tissue Remember, that's a membrane that surrounds some cartilages, so we also see it in hyaline cartilage, we don't see it in fibrocartilage. You do have some internal examples of elastic cartilage as well. So the epiglottis is elastic cartilage, at least parts of it are. And also the eustachian tubes or auditory tubes that connect the throat to the middle ear. Those are supported by elastic cartilage as well. Elastic cartilage is fairly distinctive under the microscope. It stains more darkly than hyaline cartilage, for instance, and those fibers are fairly obvious. But like the other types of cartilage, it does have cells called chondrocytes that exist within lacunae. And here we can see the three side by side, as seen under the light microscope. You can see that hyaline cartilage doesn't have any visible fibers. Fibrocartilage does, and the fibers are quite large because we're dealing with large collagen fibers. And elastic cartilage, finer elastic fibers that stain fairly darkly. Although you might not think it, blood and lymph are considered tissues. They're not solid, of course, they're fluid. They're fluid connective tissues. So blood, as you know, is the fluid that travels through your cardiovascular system. Lymph consists of interstitial fluid that's taken in from tissues 
into the lymphatic system and eventually redirected back to the circulatory system. Within blood and lymph, we have specialized cells. So within blood, we have red blood cells, erythrocytes, and we have white blood cells known as leukocytes. We also have leukocytes within the lymph. Leukocytes are involved in destroying foreign cells. They're part of the immune system. Red blood cells are transporting oxygen and carbon dioxide. We also have fragments of cells known as platelets that are involved in blood clotting. And they're also involved in healing responses. So if there's damage to, let's say, the skin or something like that, platelets arrive, release platelet-derived growth factor so that cells in the area can grow and replace the damaged cells. We're not going to talk too much about blood and lymph right now. In fact, that's it for now. This is something we'll come back to in much more detail in Bio 112. And finally, we have bone or osseous tissue. Os, O-S, is Latin for bone, so you'll run across that quite often. The skeleton does a lot of things. Bones do a lot of things. And the most obvious function is support. If we didn't have a bony skeleton, we would collapse onto the floor in a heap. But also bones will protect structures. So we have the cranium that protects the brain. We have the rib cage that protects the heart and lungs. Bones form joints where movement can occur and muscles attach to bones. So without bones, we wouldn't have much in the way of movement either. One thing that's often overlooked is that bones store materials. They store minerals. So calcium, magnesium, for instance, are stored within bones. I used to breed reptiles. And when I was breeding reptiles, I had to be really careful to make sure that they got enough calcium. So if a female was about to lay eggs, she needed lots of calcium because the eggshell contains a lot of calcium. And if she didn't have enough calcium in her diet, she'd pull calcium out of her bones and they'd become very weak and brittle. Bones are also where red blood cells are formed. So within long bones, for instance, we have the formation of blood cells. Bone consists of a mixture of a matrix containing mineral salts and calcium phosphate is the most important one, but there are others, collagen fibers and cells called osteocytes. Osteocytes maintain the bone. We have two types of bone. We have spongy bone, which consists of kind of a, a web or meshwork of bony struts called trabeculae. And then in between we have red bone marrow, so very soft tissue. We don't have any osteons in spongy bone. And that's something we'll talk about more in our next topic. And then we have compact bone, which is very dense, very solid. It makes up the outside uh, layer of long bones, for instance. And this is comprised of osteons. Bone is a mixture of flexible protein fibers, collagen mainly, and rigid minerals. And both components are essential to the structure and functioning of bone. There's a simple little experiment you can try. Take a chicken bone and throw it into a fire for a while. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna burn away all of the collagen. It's gonna burn away all of the proteins, but leave behind the minerals. And you'll be left with something that's very, very brittle. You can see that on the left here. So this bone has become very brittle. You can just turn it into powder in your hands. So the mineral alone is not enough. Now the other thing you could do is you could take your chicken bone and this time, instead of burning it, throw it into vinegar. And you have to let it sit for a week or two, but after that, the vinegar will have time to dissolve away the mineral salts. And you're left with just the collagen, just the protein. And that's what you're seeing on the right here. You end up with a very flexible bone that you can tie in a knot. And down the bottom, there's a person there with a dog skull actually, that's being completely decalcified. All the minerals have been removed with strong acid and we're left with what looks like a rubber skull, but this was just a genuine skull to start with. So the collagen adds a bit of flexibility to something that otherwise would be very brittle. There are four really important cells that are associated with bone. They all start with the prefix osteo, again, because os means bone. We have osteogenic cells, and these are cells that 
are constantly undergoing cell division and giving rise to other cell types like osteoblasts. So think of genic, meaning creation, genesis. This is the original population of cells that can give rise to new cells. So they act as stem cells within the bone. Then we have osteoblasts. These are cells that build bone. They lay down the original matrix that makes up the bone. If you see blast on the end of a cell type, it tells you that it's building stuff. Then we have osteocytes. Site just means cell. These are the cells that we find in mature bone, and they're going to maintain the bone. So they're going to rebuild fibers as needed, keep the bone happy, keep that tissue functional and maintained. Then we have osteoclasts. Osteoclasts tear down bone. So if you see clast on the end of a word, it tells you that you're dealing with something that breaks things down. So for instance, let's say you don't have enough calcium in your body. Let's say that your muscle cells are starving for calcium. They need calcium to contract and you're not getting enough calcium in your diet. Osteoclasts will be activated. They'll break down some of the bone and release calcium and other minerals into the bloodstream. Osteoporosis, for instance, is a condition where the osteoclasts are overly active. They're doing stuff they shouldn't be doing. They're breaking down bone, releasing minerals into the bloodstream far more than you need. So they're just going to be lost in the urine, but you're going to lose uh, bone mass because of these overactive osteoclasts. And I should point out that we could use these endings with respect to cartilage cells as well. So chondro means cartilage. We can have chondrogenic cells, chondroblasts, chondrocytes, and chondroclasts. And we'll talk about those a bit more next topic when we talk about the development of cartilage and the development of the skeleton. That's it for this topic. I'm not going to talk more about bone just now because our next topic is the skeleton and we'll spend quite a bit of time looking at bone then. And here's our terminology.